Welcome, my name is Gina Clonan. I'm founding president of the Connecticut Women's Hall of Fame. For nearly three decades, the hall has worked to discover and share the stories of women. Our various educational platforms acknowledge the individual and the collective feminine voice. There's no more important time than now to talk and listen. This will be a half hour intimate and informative chat followed by 15 minutes of your questions, which we encourage you to submit at any time during the webinar by simply clicking the Q&A bubble at the bottom of your screen. I'll try to get to as many as possible. Our goal is simple, a virtual gathering to talk about today's important issues. We hope this will be a useful source of information while offering up helpful takeaways. Today's chat will focus on fatherhood. This is our bookend to May's webinar on the state of motherhood after the year we've had. Unfortunately, these guys were so busy I couldn't get them in June, but we're happy to celebrate fathers any day of the year. So please welcome Connecticut's 10th District Senator, Gary Winfield, and family advocate and consultant to the National Responsible Fatherhood Clearinghouse, James Worthy. Hello guys and welcome. Thank you for having us. Thank you for having us. Thank you so much. I think we'll get right to the crux of it. And I am going to start with you, James, because we want to give a little kind of historical background of the meaning of fatherhood. So primitive societies and indigenous communities were noted as more likely to parent together. Why and when did that change? Well, the one of the biggest changes in, in the family structure, and, and we got to take it way back here in America, um, back to when wars were being fought and many of our um, fathers were out fighting those wars and coming home or not coming back, so to speak, death and war, all of these things. And it put a very uh, difficult stress on the family and on our country where there were sub-governmental programs that were even being started. Many are familiar with women, in infants and children. These are services that were actually directly uh, put together to support those families, to those moms that were widowed because of war. So it, was, it wasn't a social intervention to stop poverty or things like that. It was a social intervention to really um, keep hold the families that had lost that provider, that caregiver, or, or, or that, that father figure. That morphed us into a situation as we come back from Vietnam, where now people were coming home but they weren't in a position, whether it be alcohol, whether it be drugs, whether it be some of the things that were attacking the family. Now, the, they were, men were here, but to get these services, the financial part, to get the jobs, the things that weren't there for them, uh, these services that were given through governmental agencies now had to expand and start to put some parameters on who could get them. And many of us in this world start to fight against the, if a dad's there, you don't get help. And that's where we start to see the changes in our service models for dads and families. All right, well, let's talk a little bit more to uh, just referring back a bit to the cultural and societal changes. From the beginning, it seems that American European fathers were chiefly disciplinary as responsible for food on the table and the prayers that were said for it. Gary, what else can we remember about fathers from earlier times that maybe we still incorporate today? Well, I, I mean, I, I think to, to pause for a second, that's important, right? Because uh, uh, a lot of us still um, incorporate that into who we are. Um, but I think the history of uh, our fathers is critical to how each of us uh, acts as a, as a parent. <clears throat> whether it be our direct father, our grandfather, or people we know in the community. Um, and we bring a lot of that, that forward with us. I can tell you that uh, in, in, in my history, uh, there's a lot uh, that has affected me uh, to the point I will say even where at the moment where uh, my two youngest were born um, and they were handed to me, I actually had a moment where I stopped. I didn't, you're supposed to take the child. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I paused because the, the, the level of responsibility um, that that is hit me hard. Um, and, and I know that uh, because of many reasons, including uh, the history of this particular country, uh, the lineage in my um, 
family, fathers didn't do the greatest job, right? Um, because they weren't equipped, because of traumas, because of other things. And all of that hit me at that moment. And I'm looking at these two uh, twins, uh, these two uh, beautiful babies, and I'm stuck, right? So um, there's a lot that carries on. Some of it is uh, societal in terms of the way that society is structured in terms of masculinity and all of those issues. And some of it is the individual and the particular history that they have. Uh, and as we think about things like uh, what James works on with the Connecticut Fatherhood Initiative is, that's why they're built the way that they're built to deal with uh, bringing uh, people who are in this place of being fathers to a place where they understand uh, not only that there is a financial responsibility, not only that there is an emotional responsibility, but some color and texture to what that really is. Exactly. And, you know, a lot of our, our history would point to American European fathers. A lot of white fatherhood was portrayed in, in the statistics that we read about or the history that uh, we might touch upon. But what could be said of fathers in Black, Hispanic or Asian communities in America throughout time? And how might they have differed or not in terms of the role of the father? Well, I, I want to jump in and, and speak to that because, um, yes, there are huge cultural and ethnic differences. However, um, the the family unit, and especially here, if you go, and I'll, I'll speak from an African uh, bred uh, uh, understanding, if you look at some of the historical work of tribal fatherhood, the father was there in a lot of instances to move the young men into manhood. And I heard a, a, a proverb, a quote, an African proverb, that you are not an adult until you're 40. It was very, very often uh, seen a dad still being that uh, direct connection to uh, uh, developing a young son. And that son might be 30, 35, and still there. Here in America, what has happened is we had such hard lines on value structure, such hard lines on roles that fathers were pencil hold into one thing. And then with all of us being in a melting pot, um, some of those other traditional ways that fathers were looked at were kind of dissolved here in America because America man is produce, pay for, take care of, protect. That's what you do. We're not into the nurturing, the feelings, the, 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 that's the quote unquote mother's role, the woman's role. And you know, we've heard this for years. And what has happened today is those roles are intertwined. Those roles, uh, I'm, I'm a nurturing dad. I really am, you know, but I wasn't, my dad was an incredible father, but he wasn't the nurturing, kiss you every day, say, I love you, dad. Okay, so those are the things that, that we're looking at now. The work that we're doing is to broaden or reopen the idea that dad is not one single thing. Dad is that partner in the rearing of a child, emotionally nurturing, providing all of those things because family structure now has two people working. That's the way business is today, two people working. So mama is starting to bring in the, the bacon, so to speak. So James, you brought up a good point, Gary, just before I, because I want to ask you this, Gary, but you brought up a good point about provide, protect, and, um, and uh, produce. It's sometime during the American history, the concepts of fatherhood changed where fathers began to encourage self-esteem, self-reliance, and citizenship, which is where I want to go to you, Gary, with just such a political involvement. When do you think that changed? That became a role for fathers too, that wasn't principally a female role of nurturing, but it was nurturing because you were responsible for encouraging and inspiring the kids to, to be all that they can be. I guess I'll, I'll, I'll uh, I guess I'll respond. I'm not sure when exactly that happened, but um, maybe I'll touch it uh, as I respond partially to the last question as well. I think, you know, part of the issue that I have seen is, is as James described it, but also, um, you know, when you look at uh, things from the outside, you don't really know what's going on, right? And so uh, you will ascribe to that whatever you want to fill that vacuum with. And so, 
uh, you know, there has been a narrative about particularly black, but uh, different communities and what uh, the father not necessarily being in a home actually means. But what we know is that uh, the father can be in a home and be filling the role of provider, uh, but can also be doing things that other ways in terms of um, what they do in a relationship with the child that, that aren't positive. And so, um, you know, we look at people, they look like a certain thing, and then we ascribe a value to it that is positive or negative. But I will say that I've seen in the communities that we sometimes castigate in on these issues, uh, fathers who aren't in the home who are uh, amazing fathers, right? And fathers who aren't great fathers, we see a panoply of things. And I think what one of the things we have to come to understand is um, that, that, that <laughs> mold we want to put people in is very hard for anyone, even people of the majority, to fit into. Um, and it really doesn't do any of us well to try to put people into a mold. I think over time, uh, our society has shifted a lot in terms of the roles of men and women. Uh, and it's a lot more fluid both ways than it's ever been. Uh, and I think men have uh, emotions, right? <laughs> it's a shocking thing. Men have emotions. And in a time when uh, you can actually express those emotions, you are seeing men express those emotions. I have colleagues who uh, are the father who uh, is very happy to be at home while the, the, the wife goes out to work because you can do that more today and not be looked at as um, a crazy individual who's not a full man, right? There's, there's issues of masculinity that wrap into this for all, uh, all communities in ways that have been negative, but I think we are redefining those things. You see that in uh, gender, gender identity and, and, and uh, how expression and all of those conversations that we're having uh, as a larger part of what we're saying uh, to the public. So I think, it's, I think it's a good thing, right? I couldn't be the father that I am today uh, probably 30 years ago. So I think what I'm hearing from both of you as a result of, let's say the post-World War II uh, and then onto the Vietnam War years has really seen a change in the way we look at men, which then allows us to look at men as fathers differently. And to your point, Gary, my two sons in their 30s became first time fathers this year. And not only are they more engaged in fathers than my parents or grandparents or great grandparents were, but they are also more engaged with other men. Now, I think the strength of women for centuries has been our ability to communicate with one another and teamwork. We express our feelings, we talk to each other, we get advice from one another. I see men doing that more than ever before. What, why is that? And how can we continue to inspire that kind of masculinity? I'll jump in. I think because it's more permissible. Uh, I think because when you have seen it, uh, you recognize the value of it. I, you know, having uh, I have two older children uh, who are stepchildren, but the, the two uh, natural born children I've experienced from day one. Um, and uh, the more I learn, the more I share with my colleagues. And I will tell you the feedback from them is, uh, lets me know how important that is. Uh, and so, you know, one of the experiences I've had because I've been home with the children a lot while my wife was going out to work, um, is, uh, you know, I'm the one that was up at night a lot of the time with the children. Right. And there's that moment in the middle of the night where you, yeah, you're really tired and all of that. And then you're holding a kid and they get quiet and then you realize, wait a minute, this is amazing. And what I realized was if I were the type of father that many of the fathers before me were, I wouldn't have that experience. Right. And so I'm going out and I'm sharing this with all those fathers that are coming after me. And so they, they you know, I think we all kind of know it somewhere, but you, it's not it's not foremost in your mind, it's something you could miss, right? And the fact that I do that, and then they realize how powerful and impactful it is in their life, uh, gives them license to share as well. And so I think, it, again, it's, it's that we are at a different point where everything that we are doing allows us to do more of it. Absolutely. Okay. And I, I, I'd like to throw just another uh, point in there. One of the things that we've seen societally, uh, especially in the last 50 years, so to speak, is that places where men are, are encouraging men to talk. One, in our spiritual worlds, many of the, the, the synagogues, the, the churches, the, 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 you know, the temples, they're bringing men together to talk about men's issues. 
And that started a conversation in the world of responsible fatherhood in the actual human services work, men's groups and fatherhood groups now have been around for, I've been in this business for 30 years. So we have 30 years from when I got here, from my knowledge of now you're seeing a, a father's group, a men's group, and it's giving gentlemen an opportunity to lay down the closed up shield of I'm okay. Cause that's, that's a man's go-to answer. I'm good. Mm -hmm. My, I'm handling. And traditionally, and still to this point, because even when men do get the opportunity to express themselves, to understand their, their, their feelings, to be able to correctly share those feelings, we still have spaces where we don't get to do that. And, and I'm, I'm giving a quick example. My dad passed 10 years ago. Um, and I'm I'm a traditional old school guy. You pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Stop crying. Ain't nothing wrong with you. you know, th that's the way I grew up in the, the, the 80s. I was born in the 60s, but I'm an 80s kid. I, all the stuff I did was in that 80s time. And here's the reality. I, I was, I, I broke down. I mean, I kept it together for everything. I did the manly thing. I held it together and I broke down. The only person I was around was my wife. And in my home with my, it's a safe space, but I broke down. And as I, as I got through it, we processed it. I'm, I'm getting my, my, I'm following the, the morning process. And my wife, just maybe a couple of days after she said, Phew. I was really nervous. I said, what do you mean? She said, because if you cry, it's got to be bad. And instantly, my armor came back. Yeah. Because I never, I'm a protector. I never want her to feel unprotected. Mm -hmm. So immediately, that, that, that like transformer, that came back like, oh, I don't even have a space to cry. And those are the things, as I get older now, I just seem to cry about everything, kids are growing up and all that. But the reality is we still are getting better at letting men be whole and not parcel out their feelings. But there still is a conflict with the stereotypes because they do exist everywhere. Yes. And you do face them everywhere. Um, and I'd like to talk about that because, you know, it, we often think of feminism as the biggest influence on the changing role of men in society. Would you agree or disagree and to what degree? I'm going to throw it to Gary first because he's a politically correct gentleman. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Gary, you're on. Wow. Uh, <laughs> that, was a, that was a good throw too. Um, I, I think it has a huge impact. Um, I also think, it, it, so one of the things that I, I have, been doing for a number of years. I had a lot of uh, issues emotionally. Um, given my background, the only uh, emotion I was comfortable connecting to largely was anger. Um, and there was a lot that I had to do to deal with that, including uh, self-therapy, real therapy, and on and on and on. Um, and I came to a point where, um, after, particularly after my mother passed, where I couldn't control my emotions the way that I used to. Uh, I used to be very much what James was saying. You couldn't tell that I felt anything. Um, and I began to talk a lot more about uh, how I feel. And even if I wasn't necessarily talking about how I feel, you could tell I, I had emotions, whereas in the past, you couldn't do that. Um, and at the beginning of my political career, I got a lot of, if you are expressing yourself in that way, if you cry, then how can you lead people? Um, and what I realized along the way was like, part of my problem was that I'd never seen people do this. So what happened for me was I was like, I'm doing really well politically, I'm pretty strong. And so I'm going to keep doing this because I think like, I don't want others to be like me. And I think when you have, you have more of that than you've ever had before. You have people who can emote and still be seen as strong. And so the combination of what feminism is the ability to see models of people who, you know, nobody's going to say I'm weak politically, uh, who are strong, who even I now as a tool, I use that if I'm on the floor of the Senate, sometimes I know that I'm going to cry and everybody in the building is going to cry because I'm going to take you into that space. And I think that is what is allowing us to be in a different place. You have to be able to see it and know that it's okay to do it because if it's not okay to do it, do it, 
then you you necessarily must guard yourself. So, so you're leading by example, James. You would agree with that. I, I truly, I truly agree with that because as I've gotten better in my my career, um, those points that bring a tear to my eye, I share them. Yeah. And I share them with the emotion, and more and more people are saying thank you. But I want to do. I want to touch a little bit about what you talked about about feminism because I believe the movement for the strengthening of women was necessity, had to happen. But unfortunately in our culture, in our world, for someone to rise, unfortunately we gotta put somebody in a, a, a defeated feeling and, and I'll, I'll leave it there. But what this has done, and I'll, I'll talk about our black community. Um, we have a number of women and it's changing, I believe, but got to this point where I don't need a man became a phrase. And our women were taking on this role of super women, could do it all, and I can handle anything. And what this has done, I believe, is erode the strength of fem feminism. Because now there are women in a role that's going, I do want help. I do need a partner. I do need someone here. And it's because of the role of women are the strongest, we don't, we, we can handle anything. It has really put some of our women who are not in the, the, the directional charge of feminism, put them in this space. Am I a real woman that I want a, a, a support? That I want, maybe now I'm not a real woman. And it's killing us. In, in the black community, our women are dying earlier. They're going through more cancers. They're going through more stress-related issues. They're, they've taken on this role. And it's in some ways alleviated the responsibility of dads. Mm -hmm. Because I'm, I'm about holding dads accountable. You create a child, you got to man up and be a grown man and accept the responsibility of it. But in this space where I can say, my partner says, I don't want a man, it gives me that out. So I think feminism has done some really strong things for women. However, there is a backlash uh, that people may have taken it wrong what the feminist movement really was all about. I agree. And I think, um, you know, there are obviously as many tiers and sections of feminism as there are women, but there is a nod to that, that trying to find that equilibrium where we both can be strong. Initially, we almost had to give up being men and be being women and becoming Become men. men. Mm -hmm. so the pendulum swings so far, and now we are all looking for that life work family balance, which I think as a result of both the women's and the men's movement. And, and speaking of that, there's another thing that I've noticed, particularly in the United States over the past, past few decades, which of course is, is very prominent in third world cultures, is the idea of multi-generational living. And as one of you pointed out earlier, you know, we need help, um, all of us. And so I see a lot of that happening, particularly in the Asian and the Black communities, but also in white communities looking for, you know, I'm the 50s generation. We moved as far away from home as possible, but now kids are looking to find a way to get back to home so that you have this family tree that can support you. What would you both say about that? Um, quickly, and I want to turn it to Gary because I'd love to hear it. Um, I was a kid who grew up in that village. My great grandmother and grandfather, my grandmother and grandfather, my mother and father. It was a very tight knit arrangement. And I believe that's what saved me because I grew up in Southeast DC. But I always, when they say at father, father absences, I was I was hoping that the dads go away. Great granddad was old when I was too born. many of them. <laughs> always home. Granddad was old when I was born, so he was always home. My father, the minute those two went to sleep, he was there. So I never felt this because as a kid, I wanted freedom, and I didn't get to have that freedom, which saved my life. But the reality is, with the way the economy has started to go, it is harder for a child to move away like we could in the fifties. That's right. In the 60s. Yeah. So it's maybe out of necessity that kids are staying close. And, and I, I'm, I'm building a new home and the people building right next to us is a mom and her daughter. Yeah. You know, and, and, and it's because of financially, it's better situations. 
So I, I believe there's an economic piece to it, but I also, as a parent, without having those community connections, it's hard to raise a child, especially when both parents are working and they're doing 10, 12 hours a day outside the home. And that's why I think this new norm is becoming so uh, uh, excitable for so many people is that I'm actually home. I can take care of my kids and still make the type of money I'm used to. Let's do it. I'm getting a little feedback from somebody's mic. I don't know where that is, but maybe you both could check it. And Gary, let's talk a little bit about how the pandemic brought us all back together again. And there is more of attention being paid to how families can live closer. Yeah, I, I think, you know, many of us for a year, year, two or three months weren't leaving the house. <laughs> uh, and, and whoever we found ourselves with uh, at, at the time that this happened, uh, we spent a lot of time with. Um, and so uh, I think families had to learn how to be together in ways that we haven't been for a very long time. And, and uh, we know some of that was good and some of it wasn't. <laughs> and exactly. Some of it wasn't and became good, right? So uh, <laughs> there is that. Uh, look, I think it is critical for, for families to actually uh, be units that actually know how to engage each other. And I, I think the, the pandemic, from my point of view, has been amazing. I have. Uh, two, three-year-olds who normally I would have spent a significantly uh, lesser amount of time than I did. Uh, and so I got to experience a lot of things that I did not. I, I'm trying to figure out how do I not lose as much as I think I'm going to lose as we go back uh, to whatever normal is. Uh, but I want to I want to also touch on that notion that James touched on, because I think he's uh, absolutely right about what the economics of the situation have done to us. I think more early, more clearly, people recognize the value of um, having a community around them. And I think whether it had, in the past it had been a familial community or a community that you built, parents in order to survive in this country for a very long time now uh, have had to have a community because you go home, we have the whole 80s talking about latchkey kids, right? Somebody hopefully is there to look after your kid, whether it's your grand, the grandfather, grandmother, so, or neighbor. Uh, and, you know, for me, I grew up in a community where it was the neighbors, right, who were kind of around and kind of keeping an eye on you. I didn't have my grandparents right there. Uh, but we find ways to uh, have our kids looked after. And so uh, as things develop in the, e e the economy, uh, makes it harder to leave and harder to, to stand up on your own as early as we used to be able to. I think we're discovering that, um, you know, there is a value to that as well. And that is that we are around those people who are our natural community, which is the family. Um, and you know, as we launch out, we also recognize that, hey, they supported me all this way. Why am I breaking away from them in the way that we used to? I'm not going as far away. I'm not trying to just escape. I might want to get out of that house, <laughs> but I'm not trying to get as far away. And I think um, that's, that's an important thing because I think also what's lost sometimes in the trying to get far, far away is the story of the family itself. Okay. You know, I, I don't have that. I've been working for the last year. I've had some extra time, right? I've been working for the last year or so to rebuild that and to build those uh, branches on the tree and figure out what the stories are. And I think, you know, the way that we're changing, some of it is not great, but there are some really valuable things that are coming out of it. I agree. Thank you both for that. Um, I'd like to talk, I'd like to remind all of you listening in today that we're going to open it up to your questions soon. So please, just by clicking the Q&A bubble at the bottom of your screen, post a question and we'll get to them soon. Um, one thing I wanna talk about is with the onslaught of men's and parenting groups, and we've just talked about the attention that's being paid to, um, to looking at our family, looking at our ancestry, our history, there seems to be an organizational thrust for attention to fathers. Uh, and I know that, James, you can speak to this, but one example that's close to my heart is both of my daughter-in-laws got months off for parental leave, and my sons get a week or two. So, I mean, there's one big thing that is being overlooked, the bonding between a father and a child, which is equally as important as a mother and a child. We know that. And I noticed with my boys, they sent pictures of them holding their babies on their naked chest. And when I asked them about that, 
it was because they have learned that that's such an important part of a baby's bond and mothers do it naturally. We're breastfeeding. We're in the hospital with the baby put to our chest and fathers are intentionally doing it. What other things that do we need, James, to make these kinds of things more acceptable, more not more known, more everyday occurrences? I'm so happy you said that. Um, one of the things, and for everyone that's on the line, I'm gonna, I'm a, I'm a direct you to something called fatherhood.gov, and the education to the the ability to normalize fathers being dads is something that has been a, a major part of the transition. As a matter of fact, I wanna kind of walk you through television, if I can, and how we're getting to where we are and where we need to be. Um, it used to be a point in time, 60s, 70s, when you saw a dad on TV, he was either the, the breadwinner or he was crying about not having bread to win. Uh, he was the goofball, got, got to a point where dads were goofballs, the Homer Simpsons, the, the Al Bundys, they were little, 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 uh, dimwit, so to speak. We lost that uh, father's knows best. We lost that uh, Andy Griffin. We lost that and we got into where dads were these bumbling goofballs. And today, what you're seeing, when you look at the Huggies commercials, when you look at all the commercials that are coming up during the Super Bowls now, you're seeing fathers change diapers. You're seeing fathers laugh and joke with their kids. You're seeing fathers do homework. You're, you're seeing dads in, the in roles that were traditionally what moms do. So how do we support that? In programming, we are really looking at providing services to normalize dads being nurturers. And that's where I think we're, we're going to be able to move this. Uh, and at that website, we have events and things for dads where dads and children can be seen in that role. Um, that whole bonding, we have a whole session around teaching dads to bond, but also this is changing in the medical world. Some of the Family Leave Act is starting to talk about giving dads equal time for the recovery after a child is born. So I, I, I think that's huge. I know my son is, my oldest is 20, my middle is 18, and my youngest is 15. And I got to spend a, a lot of time with all of them. My, my kids, fortunately, have, they say, Dad, do you even work? You never, you're always home. Well, I've been working from home for so long, you know, that, that, but who took him to the doctor's appointment when my oldest son was sick for two years and couldn't go to school? Who took him to, 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 who took him to a doctor's appointment? Who was in the house? But I do remember now it's normalized because of COVID. Everybody's working from home. So it's okay for dad to be home and okay that dad had a break in his work schedule while mom is working at home. So dad took him to the doctors. That's becoming okay now. But when my son was 12, my wife, often was asked, well, what does your husband do that he doesn't, he, he's at home? That's right. And now my wife, who is a protective mama bear for all of us, she's ready to attack. Don't, don't make him less than a man because he's, home. you know what I'm saying? So all of what we're doing, the imaging, the stories, the, the how-tos is starting to change. And we've got we've to gotta get everybody to know that it's okay for dads to be nurturers. It's okay for dads to be home. It's okay for dads to have post uh, postpartum uh, 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 syndrome. Did mm. you know that's even a thing? Mm. I didn't know that was a thing. <laughs> so well, you know, I love that because we named this webinar today, Fatherhood, Nature and Nurture. And yes. your conversation with me is leading to all those things. And I want to take this opportunity to talk about um, dad's role and how they can make a difference. And Gary, I was so impressed with your work on the Crown Act. And I'm not sure that many people know what that is, but obviously inspired by your role as a father. And that's the best thing you can ever give to your kids is making a change that's so remarkable. Can you speak to that? Sure. And uh, Representative Robin Porter and others, she was obviously the lead here in Connecticut and others uh, did amazing work on it. Uh, but what the Crown Act was, is, is it's still underway. We're still trying to get this uh, spread across the country is basically affirming the fact that uh, we don't we aren't all the same and that on top of our head, the hair that we wear is different and that uh, if 
uh, a white person can go out the house and have their hair natural and black people should be able to go out the house and have their hair natural. So uh, during the debate, I told the story of uh, hair uh, throughout the history of the country uh, and uh, impacts in my life and those who touch my life. Uh, and what I really said to people is that my daughter, Imani, uh, right now I watch her, she runs around, uh, she's free, uh, she's amazing but the constrictions will come. Uh, and people will tell her that, it, although her father is affirming her and telling her how beautiful and amazing she is, there's a part of her, her hair, that isn't amazing. There's a part of her that's as natural as every other part of her that isn't good enough. Uh, and part of this fight is to make sure that she understands, not just from her father, but from the society in which she lives, that she is fine. Um, I just want to very briefly touch on, because I can't let it go, uh, the conversation you just had with Jane, because I want people to understand that, you know, part of the problem is the way that we have conceived fathers, but I know I have Imani and Gary who are twins, and they were born early, premature, and when they were in the NICU, you know, one of the things that you have to have happen when your kids are in the NICU is they have to be able to eat on their own, right, um, and start gaining weight and all of those things, and we discovered uh, that bond that we talk about with the mother that always happens. My wife had the bond with the kids, but for some reason, no matter who would go in that NICU, my son would not eat unless he was in my arms. And I didn't have family and medical leave. I didn't have the extra days. And so I would go to work and you know what I was doing all day at work? Thinking about how fast can I get back there so that this, this boy can eat so we can get him out of the NICU and get home. And this is part of why you know, it's not about the mother or the father. It's about the mother and the father. It's the family unit. And, you know, children bond to each, but they have a different bond with each. And sometimes the bond they have with the mother is critical at a moment, but sometimes the bond they have with the father is critical at, at a specific moment. And for my son, that bond, for whatever reason that he had to me, was critical to his ability to eat. That's what we're talking about when we're talking about this. Is I didn't want to let that go without telling that story. I'm so yeah, glad you didn't right. let that go, Gary, because it is such a touching and moving story and, and uh, inspirational. Um, so before we open it up to questions, I, I, have to, I wouldn't be a good feminist if I didn't ask you guys um, about co-parenting. It seems it's in full swing for many families, but women still note that parenting is just one aspect of the domestic realm. How can we get fathers and husbands to truly share the load? Woo, let, let, can I jump in and I'll make it real quick. Um, <laughs> there, is, there is a, and I'm just gonna go from a, uh, we do all of these sessions around co-parenting and communication. So much of it is communication and others not putting their thoughts on your specific relationship. Um, and give a, a, a huge, you know, a, a, a grandma might say, well, that man, you need him to do this. And he's like, well, he's taking care of this. I'm taking care of that. Um, you know, could be money, you know, separate bank accounts. Well, girl, you need to have your own. And what happens is so many of us are trying to figure this thing out based on other people's uh, rules for success. So for, for me, I'm always teaching to any father or, or couple that I'm working with that may not be in the home together, especially when they got to blend families, mm -hmm. is where are your strengths? Where are your strengths? And how do we make sure that everything that needs to get done is done by the person that's most skilled to do it? Give an example. Um, in my household, my, my, we are always, my wife is the take care of everything type of person. So I am like, where am I strong? I'm strong in the kitchen. I clean, I love cleaning the kitchen. I love vacuuming floors. It's the noise thing. I'm a little crazy kid. So the noise, so vacuuming is my thing. Kitchen is my thing. That's my thing. I get out of the way. Bathrooms are my thing. Washing clothes is her thing. And what we try to do is not get in each other's way of doing their thing. And that's where uh, it, it comes down to, are we communicating and are we asking for help if our thing gets overwhelmed by the one thing that we both do and that's work. And that's like that. 
oftentimes it's, you know, if, if my wife has sessions going along and we've all working at home right now, but she's like, I got, I got two events are going on until six. And I'm like, I got an eight. She said, well, can you knock out you, can you knock out dinner? I got dinner. It, and, and, you know, friends come over and see me cook and they like, it's no issue. They like, you're worthy to cook. So it, it's those things. I think that help us to really start to help people stop letting everything else define what works for you as co-parenting communication talk about where you are and we have things at fatherhood.gov to help people with that level of communication and gary you're part of a power couple well known here in the state so how do you guys handle that we we uh much to james point we do what we each do well uh i obviously as i've suggested have the kids more time than my wife and uh, fortunately, I am uh, more impervious to noise and, <laughs> uh, and and motion than my wife is, but I think that's what it is. And I think, you know, this is partially an answer to one of the questions I saw in the Q&A too. I think as time moves on, uh, you're seeing this more and more where people are figuring that the models we had in the past don't necessarily have to be the models of the future. And uh, you watch television shows, the, the roles are a little different than they were in the 70s and, and all of that. And it makes it uh, easier to do something different than it's happened in the past. And then you have people, even like myself, although I don't want to talk about myself this way, that people say, oh, you're a great father, right? And so people are saying, well, that's a great father. And you see that model where I cook too in my house, right? Where the father is cooking and he, he might be doing the washing and stuff like that. Then you don't, you no longer think, well, that's the role of the mother. You start to think, I'm not sure who has what role. Maybe we can share whatever role we're good at. And I think that is uh, where we're headed in the future. Well, one the of the questions, of go ahead, James, sorry. That's the role of a parent. Yeah. And well, you know, we, in our circles uh, with the Connecticut Women's Hall of Fame, we talk constantly about role models. In fact, we use the lives of the women that we honor to create educational programming for using those as role models. And I know that you're talking a lot about modeling. So what advice would you give to, this is from someone in our audience, would you give to other men supporting gender equality? You've certainly told them, you know, be it, see it, be it, show it. Uh, what else might you say? Because I, I can't help but think, you know, growing up and still today, uh, such negative terms about young boys and men, sissy, don't cry, uh, you know, with you're out with, with your guys, you know, guy friends for a beer and they go, oh, you're going home or you got a babysitter, or you got to cook. There's still a lot of negative language and conversation around, among the evolve, uh, about the evolving roles of, of men and fathers. Can you speak to that? Uh, I'll jump. Go ahead, Gary. Go ahead, jump in on that. Well, I was going to say, you know, some, some of this stuff is just equipping people with tools to deal with it. I've, I've experienced that. Oh, you're going home. You got to be home. I'm like, I'm not sure why you don't want to be home. But yes, I'm going home. Right. Um, but, I, but I also think that, you know, they're, they're, the roles we have had before, I think many of us intuitively know haven't worked for us. And as fathers, we have to be invested in making sure that our sons don't have, uh, and mothers too, don't have the experiences that we've had. And so for me, what that means is, you know, when my, when my older boy, because my younger boy hasn't had these opportunities yet, but when my older boy, uh, you know, has been frustrated or angry and there's emotion and he's trying to hold it back because of some of the things he's been taught, you know, I've said to him, there's a, there's a, there's a space for you to be emotional. We are human beings. We, we have to be emotional. And if we're not, uh, then we have a problem because what we're going to do is take all of that emotion, put it inside, and it's going to eat us alive. And so I'm teaching him that it's okay to be emotional. It's also a time where you don't share all of yourself with everybody at every moment. So it's not about the fact that you're crying. It's that you don't always give every emotion away, right? And so I'm not making the, the fact that he cries or he acts in any one way negative. It's just that you don't always give everything away. And so at the same time as I'm trying to teach him that, it's not always actually appropriate. I'm not saying it's a negative thing. And I think we've got to learn how to uh, do that dance so that we don't teach our boys, since we're talking about them, that this motion is necessarily negative. Thank you, Gary. Um, Jane. And I've got to say this, I am old school. So this is, this is one of those conversations 
that uh, I'm supporting myself in understanding gender equality. Um, because I, you got to know, I spent a bulk of my young, young childhood with a Black man who was born in 1900. Okay, so there is a bunch of male stereotypical things that um, uh, that I was objected to and lived by. So as I've started to one from a, a male from a grown male perspective, support groups, men's groups have allowed us to see each other and see that it's okay to say, yes, I'm going home. I'm in a happy relationship. I'm out. No, I'm not partying with you guys to go meet some ladies. I'm going. So those men's groups and 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 when you get single dads and and dads and 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 healthy relationships, when you get them in a room, it allows people to see that there is significant strength in that. That starts to tear down the the old school guy. But yeah. then as a parent, um, one of the things that I had to figure out early with sports and this and that. Um, was to allow my children to express what was their interest and not my interest. Guiding always, because I think sometimes we we get in this point we don't we don't think it we think it's wrong to guide. And as a parent, my job is to guide. I'm just that's the way. If I made a mistake, sorry, but I'm going to guide my children. But the, one of the things I, I talk about, my oldest son, not a football player, he's a basketball guy. You know, now he's not really into sports at all. My middle son's going to college on a scholarship, foot, football scholarship. That's all he plays. He's he's that dude. And my youngest son is a, uh, he was a gymnast. He's a singer, a drummer, an actor, a football player, a basketball player. He's done it all. And even managing the equality in the, in the circle of the boys you know, when he was taking gymnastics, like, yeah, I burned it up. You know, the words that come up. I was like, whoa, whoa time out. Amari's stronger than both of you. Yeah. Let's see. Let's do handstand push-ups. And Amari at five was doing handstand push-ups. My football playing son couldn't do one. So <laughs> it immediately equalized his respect for something different. Good. And that's where I always want respect people's ability and want to do other things. And that's the only real advice I can give. Um, you know, I had a guy say, my, my son ain't in the sports. He's an old football player. My son, ah, he's in the house. I said, well, what does he love? Man, he's on the game. I said, have you ever sat down and played the game? Man, he don't play no sports game. I said, well, play the game he plays and watch. When I took my son to a Pokemon tournament at 13, at 12, People like your 12 year old son is your football coach. He's playing Pokemon. Yeah. And he's darn good at it too. <laughs> so that's where you just, you got to get right. So get into programs and things that help you get your old stereotypes under control, but then give your kids. And I'm talking boys. Cause that's all I got, but girls, I'm, I'm, I'm old, old school. So I'm, I'm working on that too. <laughs> so, so, but give your kids the opportunity to express difference. I coach football and my number one player on my 10 U team spring season this year was a young girl by the name of Macy. She was a defensive end and she's the baddest thing on our team. I love and it. I the love boys it. Jane. We're like, I'm scared of Macy. I was like, yeah, cause that's how girls do. <laughs> Well, uh, that's it. The takeaway is to, as fathers, to look at your personal strengths and to encourage those in your offspring, be they boys or girls. I'm going to close with one final question uh, from our audience. In your, oh, no, wait, we've got another one. Hold on, I'm going to do two. So do you find that dads who are the primary caregiver struggle with the life work balance and end up carrying the load in their family unit? I'm just going to say this and I'm turning to Gary because he can speak to this probably better than I can. I, I was just told something by one of my mentors. He says, there's no such thing as worth like work life balance. There's no such. That's a misnomer. It, that means that all things even out and they're equal. They're not. It's about work life priorities. Mm -hmm. What do you prioritize? OK, good. And Gary. that's all I can ever say. Yeah. Yeah, no, I think that's correct. I think that if you're the primary caregiver, whoever, whatever you are, man or woman, you're going to feel like it's difficult to uh, make things work. Maybe not balance, but make things work. And that's just an outgrowth of 
what you're dealing with, right? Because you're, you're, you have the kids, if you're the primary caregiver, uh, you're providing for them to eat, you're cleaning, you're doing well. Who, who amongst us can do that and feel like they're doing everything well? But I think it is really about prioritizing and finding a system that works for you. And that's what it really is. And I just wanna, uh, since we're ending, just say back to the conversation we had, the point of that is something I heard a reverend say once before that, um, you know, whatever your kids turn out to be, uh, difference is not deficient. That's really what it is. It's just different and it's its own special thing. So. Mm -hmm. Thank you. One last question, guys. How do you see the future of fatherhood? James? Uh, I'll tell you this, guys. Uh, and from a service point of view, I just want to talk about that. Um, until we make fatherhood a, 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 a word that you don't need to put responsible in front of, and it becomes something we think about through all service, through all employment, it, and when it becomes as an intentional as we have for parenting, because parenting means mother in, in the world of service. Okay, parenting often means mom and child. Until we take away the mom and child and parenting means equal, family means equal, I believe that we have to make fatherhood an intentional addition to any service we are providing. It's got to be done with intentionality until it becomes a habitual situation. And that's my belief. And that's why I'm still in this work. Thank you, Gary. And, and I would just say, way. sorry about that. I, and I will just say to add to that, and I think we're moving in that direction. All of the stuff that we talked about today indicates that the, what you see on television, what you have people like myself and others who are out there willing to be a model of a different sort. All of that is saying that uh, we're moving to a different space. And the more of us that take on these roles as a uh, primary caregiver or equal, whatever that is, <laughs> caregiver, and who are you know, in, engaged in a way that my father and grandfather and the people before them weren't, the more that this is intentional in the way that James is talking about, the more that it has to be because look, we know, we often talk about it. If men had the, this role that women had, this would be different. Well, that's what you're seeing. Right. <laughs> That's well, we've gone yeah. over time today, and with good reason, I'd like to thank you both, Gary and James, for taking the time from your responsibilities to talk with me. And I'd also like to thank the William and Alice Mortensen Foundation and Avangrid Foundation in partnership with CNG, SCG, and UI for supporting this series. I've often said publicly that gender equity is as good for men and boys as it is for women and girls. So remember, Love and equality begins at home. I hope today's conversation has elucidated that and inspired us to be all the best we can be. And a reminder, on August 19th, I'll be talking with Connecticut's Acting Commissioner of Education, Charlene Russell, Russell Tucker, about Connecticut's classroom comeback, conditions, concerns, and challenges. Join me, won't you? Until then, stay healthy, stay happy. Thanks again, guys. You were fabulous. Thank you. Thank you so much. Appreciate it.